Welcome to our deep dive into preprints and OA or open access. Uh, I'm Brian Cook. Stacy, I assume you're not there yet, uh, but uh, when you are, let me know. And Stacy Shaw from Worcester Serve Polytechnic Institute. I'm a professor at University of Virginia. My background is special education, uh, and, but uh, I've become very interested in. Uh, open science and in particular uh, done some work and, and uh, have used preprints um, quite a few times and so have some background in them, but I, I think we're all kind of learning this and, and figuring it out. Uh, we'll go over open access uh, and, and then talk about preprints, uh, which is a, a form of open access and, and I think uh, one that we really strongly recommend. So open access. Uh, the rationale for open access is to make your work open and available to the public. And one of the panelists, I forget who, maybe I think Pam this morning talked about, um, you know, in education, our, our, what we do is to improve educational practice and the impact of our work depends on getting it not just to other uh, people in the research community, but to other stakeholders, including educators and, and uh, administrators and parents and policy makers. And very often they simply can't access uh, the, the work that we've done. Um, even at a major research university uh, like UVA, there's still tons of stuff I can't access. Uh, and it, it's just, a, a shame and, and the publishing model is, is such that we do this work, we even review the work. Um, we, the, uh, edu researchers are editors of the journals and, and yet um, the universities have to pay huge amounts of money to provide access to the work that we've done and reviewed and edited uh, in the in the process making publishers uh, millions and, and millions of dollars. And it's not, it's behind a paywall. It's not available to the public that, that it should be available to. Um, open access helps uh, promote scientific literacy uh, with, uh, with that research out there. Uh, it, it's just in terms of ethical dissemination, it just makes sense to, to make our work uh, broadly accessible. Uh, and some of the point I, I just made about researchers don't get paid to publish, reviewers don't get paid to review. Um, so you know, uh, we're just making the publishers money here. Uh, different levels, uh, different types of open access. So gold, AERA open, uh, I think it's a couple years old now, but it's a, a relatively new journal that's an example of a gold journal. Everything in that journal is, is open. If you publish in the journal, it is open access and it's licensed as open access. Um, with gold journals, most, not all gold journals, but most gold journals and, and probably the bigger, more prominent gold journals that you may be aware of, like uh, AERA Open, authors have to pay what they call an APC or a, an article processing charge. So in other words, the, the journal has to cover operating costs. Uh, many of the open journals are um, not necessarily uh, run through a professional organization, but are run by publishers and they still wanna make some money off of this. Um, APCs vary. Uh, a lot of journals, including AERA Open, have a sliding scale for fees where it is, um, less, for example, for a doctoral student or early career researcher. Uh, and so some of it, it depends and it, and it varies by journal. They tend to, to run 2,500 uh, to 3,000 US dollars, but, but there's a great deal of variability. So it is not cheap to publish in, um, in, in these journals uh, with, the APC, with the APCs. Green is, uh, self-archival and probably the best example of uh, green OA is the, uh, the preprints. And so this is, it, it is typically 
uh, you can self-archive work that you've written. Uh, it's in a, it's usually a PDF of a Word document and it is before uh, it has uh, been reviewed, before you've gotten feedback. Uh, it's not the, the version, uh, the, the PDF of the journal formatted uh, manuscript, but instead a PDF of that Word document. And you, uh, for in, in most cases, you can post that on a personal website, on an institutional repository, uh, and, and on a, on a preprint repository, which we'll talk more about. Bronze uh, occurs, this is most of our, most of the big journals in the field now have gone to, they have, um, oh, I'm, I'm getting hybrid and bronze confused for a second. Bronze is where a journal or publisher chooses to make something open. And they can do this and they do it all the time when sometimes it almost seemingly by fiat, but sometimes it's strategic and they'll say, oh, here's a special issue that we really want to push. Let's make the lead uh, article open. And so it becomes um, open, but with bronze, it's not licensed as OA. And so they can stop it from being open access at any point and usually do at some point. And because it's not licensed as OA, there are limitations on what others can do in terms of, of them sharing it. Uh, so bronze is an option we see more and more, and it's actually the most common uh, type of open access publishing currently. And uh, hybrid is where it's in a traditional journal where most of the, the work is, is closed and, and behind a paywall, but authors have the option to pay an APC and make their specific article open. Most of the journals that are published by major publishers have hybrid options. And down there, most uh, scholarship remains closed and it's, it's just behind a paywall. Hey, Brian, I just wanna chime in really quickly. I'm so sorry I'm late. I'm glad that this uh, unconference has embraced the chaos because I got totally side riddled with the conversation and lost track of time. Hi everyone, I'm Stacy. Brian, thank you for starting without me. I just wanna mention really quickly, um, I'll monitor chat, uh, that Yvonne says that there is another term out there, uh, the diamond open access. And so this is defined as this non-commercial academic led open license OA. And this model is broadly used in the so-called global South and in many universities in Europe too. So uh, do you know about that? Can you talk about that a little bit? Me? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I've heard the term a little bit around, but um, I don't know if anyone else has heard of this term before, but I think I've, I've heard of it, but it's not as common as these other ones that Brian has been talking about. It, the person, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I forget the, the name that you mentioned. Um, the, whoever made the comment, do you want to share a little bit about uh, Diamond Open Access? Sure, thank you. Uh, yeah, well, I think this, this term is not, you know, as broadly used as the gold open access or green, but it is very common. The model is very common. So I'm calling, you know, on behalf of the Latin American model, because actually I'm from Mexico and in Latin America, it's very common to use this model, which means that uh, the, uh, these journals, they don't charge any APC because the journals are funded by universities and mm -hmm. or governments, right? Mm -hmm. So there's no, uh, you know, the model is absolutely not non for profit. And it's not just used in in Latin America, also in Asia and in Africa too. And in, in many institutions in, in Europe, you know, uh, maybe small or big universities that run these uh, journals or books uh, but they, they don't have the purpose of making profits from this. And then uh, the administration and all the operations of the journals are run by, by the faculty, right? So this is kind of, I think it's a model that it's not um, very well known, but I think we should promote this too, because this idea of APCs or sorry, open access linked to an APC is actually very polemical. And it is, it, you know, it's, it is causing a lot of discussions on what we're going to do now in terms of uh, financing the publications. Yeah, very good. And, and so we'll talk about preprints, which would be another option to avoid APCs. But this diamond model, which, is, as you say, it now it, it does ring a bell to me, um, makes 
a ton of sense in that it is basically the gold publishing option minus the, the APC or without the APC. And uh, it sounds like uh, taking the, uh, the, the journal or, or, or the publishing process out of the hands of the, the for-profit publishers and putting it into nonprofit universities, which, which I think holds, just makes a, a lot of sense. I don't know if it would be called diamond publishing or diamond OA exactly, but uh, there are a number of gold journals that don't charge an APC. And in my little field of special education, these are more small professional organizations that have their, that have a journal, but they're really kind of run off the backs of the members and that there, there's not a lot of cost in them and they're not being done for a profit. So they're almost gold open access by default because they don't, they don't charge anything. They have very low overhead. Um, it, it, it's almost just like posting things on a, on, on a website, um, which isn't that much different than what most uh, journals are actually. Uh, but, but they do it uh, not through a, a university, but just through a small professional organization. Yeah, and, I, and if I can just add uh, something else very quickly, is that uh, the DOEJ, the Directory of Open Access Journals, in, in their database, they have these costs, the APCs. So you can you can see and look for a journal there that charges or not or doesn't charge any APC. So I think it's very useful to have this information just in one database. So I think uh, it's, it's a good idea to, yeah. And yep. um, yeah, and, and because, you know, sometimes I, I just, uh, a couple of days ago, I, I saw that PLOS One, this big journal that is super high quality and prestigious, yep. charges like one one thousand and six hundred, or or for medicine your uh, articles is four thousand, right? So it's yeah. I think we should promote also the other non APC journal. I, I think it is yes, I agree a hundred percent. I think it's wasn't it Nature that that just came out with their hybrid option. And uh, the C is, I forget the figure, but just- Like $9,000. Shockingly, yeah. It, yeah. It, it, no, it's ridiculous. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's super high. Um, I'm looking at chat asking about this. So Brian, do you mind actually going to the next slide where we talk about this? And I'm, I'm happy to just take over the slide. So yes, or actually go back one. Um, all the way to the DOJ. Yes, yeah, so if you wanna find open access um, journals, go to doaj.org. So this is the directory of open access journals. Um, this, this might be a little bit of an old uh, screenshot, but basically you can type in um, the name or like just a key term and, and find journals and look at what they charge, um, if they're gold, if they're bronze, if they're hybrid. And this is a really great way for you to sort of identify journals where you could publish your work that would be open access. Um, yeah, and as Yvonne said, like you could also look at the, the cost of the article processing charge. So this is a really good sort of like, um, first first step um, looking at where you could publish, but sometimes this isn't always an option, right? Sometimes you really need to go for that flagship journal or sometimes, you know, maybe there isn't really anything there for you. So uh, Brian, do you mind going to the next slide, please? Um, so a lot of people ask, like, is there funding for open access author fees, those APC charges? And usually the answer is, if you if you do have them, they're either through your un, your university or through grants that you have, and so not many of these of us have these grants or are part of these universities, especially nowadays with the budgets being very tight. So there are a couple of ways you can sort of work around this to make your work more open access, even if you have to publish it in a journal that has a paywall. Um, Brian, do you mind going to the next slide? Um, so yes, workarounds. So one um, thing I usually suggest to people is to put your work if you publish it in a journal on ResearchGate. So for example, one time I, pu I put up an article there, I published in like Educational Psychologist, and they were like, hey, you get 50 free e-copies to send to all your friends. And I'm like, well, I don't have 50 friends, obviously. Like, this is, this is just weird, right? Like, I have 50 free copies. Like, what does this mean? So what I did was I put it on ResearchGate. And what people can do is when they search for that piece of work or search for those key terms, they could find it on ResearchGate and request, request Request that you give them a copy of it. And so technically you have 50 free articles, so you can upload it privately and just shoot them off the, the email basically through ResearchGate. So it's a really nice way to sort of interact between that. Um, 
uh, Helen says the problem with ResearchGate is that it's only available to those with .edu email address. Yeah, so that is definitely a barrier. I think this is where preprints could come in, but if this is an option for you, you can definitely use uh, ResearchGate to share privately um, within our community, right? So it's a really easy way to like request. You can also just email the author. People don't know this though. So sometimes if you um, if people don't know to email you, they might be able to still find you on ResearchGate and request it. Um, so yeah, you can definitely add as full text. Do you mind going to the next slide? Yeah. Um, another thing you can do, and we're starting to get to the preprint land, right, is check out the Sherpa Romeo license check. So if you just Google Sherpa Romeo, it's this really awesome website where you can type in the journal name into the actual uh, website. Uh, go to the next slide if you don't mind, Brian. Um, so you'll do that. And what you'll see is all of their licensing, right? What you can do with what. So I typed in, I think this is educational psychologist again, and it tells me what I can do with the published version of my article, the accepted version of my article. Um, I think there's two different paths for that and the submitted version. So the submitted is the manuscript I've written and submitted to, right? There's no refereeing, there's no peer review changes or anything like that. Um, and then um, what you can do with sort of the other stages of the manuscript. If you go one more slide ahead, Brian, I think I have here. Um, yeah, so for this one, for the accepted version, so I've submitted my article, they've given me edits uh, to make, I've made those edits. And with that, I can just look at this website and know what I can do. So I see here immediately, there's an 18 month embargo. So I'm technically not supposed to put, uh, publish or post this on ResearchGate or any of these repositories for at least 18 months. Not all journals are like this. Some of them are like, go for it, right? So you could just do that immediately. But this is sort of where you can check what you can do with what journal. Um, and then they'll say, what the conditions are. So basically, if you're not really sure where to start with your journal, go ahead and um, go to Sherpa Romeo and then just look and see sort of what their policies are. This is also how you can choose what journal you want to submit to, right? So if you have two that you're like, I don't really know which one, check out what you can do with your preprints, your postprints, the submitted versions of those manuscripts. And maybe one is a lot more open to the idea of open access, putting it on ResearchGate, that sort of thing. And you can go ahead and maybe um, pick that one instead. Um, and chime in Stacy yeah I, I know um, I think especially for some of the the smaller journals they might not be on uh, Sherpa Romeo and there's sometimes a lag between um, when Sherpa Romeo um, the the policies if a, if a journal uh, changes their policies they might not be immediately reflected especially if a journal is published by one of the bigger publishers they're doing a better and better job about putting this information on their website. So looking at the journal website and or the publisher website uh, is also another uh, source. And if you're just not sure, shoot an email off to the, to the editor and, and they should be able to answer these questions. And just one question I had, Stacy, for you. So this embargo here, that's the embargo for the publisher formatted, ver of sharing the publisher version formatted, mm -hmm. correct? And okay. so, if, and, and so we'll talk about um, with preprints, uh, typically you can share the author formatted version before uh, changes were made uh, as a result of peer review. Um, yes. you, can, you can self archive that through, through green open access publishing. Yeah, so um, if you go back the one slide, they have the different categories. And so they they term them published version, which is like the publisher's PDF, right? It's the one that's fancy and format and all that sort of stuff. Then there's the two different versions of the accepted one. I'm actually not sure off the top of my head what this is. So you'd have to just look at it and read it carefully. Um, and then the submitted version and that submitted version is considered the preprint. But I think after these slides, Brian, you dive right into preprint. So maybe yeah. if anyone has any questions. Oh, uh, Helen says the administrators of Sherpa Romeo are quick to edit if you contact them. Okay, cool. So if you find a discrepancy, you can definitely let them know. Funding providers, pathways. can you share the author formatted version after the published version has been released or does it have to go up in advance? You can publish a preprint anytime you want and we'll talk about that. Okay, yeah. Before, and, and that is essentially because that's before you, you have the copyright for that author formatted version that that's mm -hmm. your work and so you can do what you want with it before you submit and you can do what you want with it 10 years after it's been published or yeah, immediately after it's been published. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah okay so uh pre-prints i think we're doing okay on time here but 
I... We'll have a lot of questions at the end. Yeah. 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 And so we'll want to have time to talk. So some terminology. Preprint is used in two different ways, or at least that's how I find it, uh, as kind of a common generic term that is uh, about a an author formatted print, an author formatted version of a paper. Sometimes that's just generically referred to as preprint. Uh, but uh, I, I'll try to, at least in, in the rest of this, uh, be more specific. And so a preprint is that author formatted paper, usually a PDF of your Word document, um, that is uh, before edits have been made reflecting peer review from submission to a journal. So this is your work. You can pretty much do what you want with it. Um, Again, sometimes it's used more generically to refer to preprints and postprints, but preprint before edits uh, from the peer review process, postprint after edits have been made, reflecting the peer review process from submission to a journal. Uh, and I, I, I've seen some people moving more towards uh, print, which refers to preprints and postprints. So just these um, self archived, publicly available versions. Of, of manuscripts, um, regardless of whether it was before or after uh, edits from uh, peer review have been made, sometimes are more generically referred to as prints. Mm -hmm. So why do we do this? We, we've talked about a number of these already, but I think the main one is just it, we can provide free and open access, and that's going to increase the impact of our work by making it available to a, a much greater audience at, at no cost. In fact, I think reflective of um, that increased impact is there's some research showing that preprinted articles are associated with higher citation rates. So they're, uh, as much as I think most of us are thinking about this in a more altruistic sense of, of democratizing access to, to scholarship and, and research, there's also a, a kind of personal benefit uh, to the researchers around higher citation rates. It can help public uh, combat publication bias in that you're having trouble getting a, uh, a paper with no results uh, published uh, or, or a paper that others just don't find particularly compelling uh, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, put it out there as a, a, as a preprint or as a print. Uh, and then it is uh, available to be included in syntheses and meta-analyses and helps combat that, that publication bias. Uh, and so that relates to the, the next point. Um, makes research available more quickly. There's been a lot of literature in the last uh, months, uh, less in education, although some, uh, but in, in other fields, preprints have really gotten on the map with the pandemic. And instead of waiting months, potentially years, to go through the peer review process and multiple rounds of review at one or potentially two or three different journals before uh, work is published, Pre-printing, it is, as soon as you write it up, it's out there. I, well, usually it takes a day or so. Um, there's usually some kind of, of um, very slight vetting process to make sure that uh, the content is relevant and you're not just putting an ad out there. Uh, but the preprints, it, it, it's out there, boom. And so uh, it just cuts down on the time and makes uh, research available really quickly, which in a lot of cases is, is really important. If you do a, a preprint and, and it's really a preprint before you submit, it allows uh, you to try to solicit and, and get feedback uh, from the research community before you submit to a journal. I, I think in, at least in education, this is in its infancy. There's not a ton of feedback being provided, but in the ideal uh, print community, we would have a, a robust community of people contributing feedback to work. And I, I think this would be a great area for those of you with doctoral students to get doctoral students used to reviewing papers. They can comment on and provide feedback to, to preprints and it, it could be a nice uh, feedback community. Um, you can also, there are no page limits uh, in, uh, in, in, at least that I'm aware of, on any print archive. And so you can uh, include extended information on the methods or, or accessible summaries for 
uh, practitioner audiences, for example, you can put those, they may not get published, but these could be important pieces of, of information and, and those can be provided on uh, print archives and provides a way for you to empty your file drawer. Again, related to this uh, combating pub publication bias is I, th I think all of us have, have work on that, that we've just never published for one reason or another. And uh, in, I, I, I've thought about trying to, to organize something in, in education, but in different communities, they have um, kind of empty the file drawer initiatives and just encouraging everyone to go back and try to get all those papers that you've never published get them out there. Um, they, should, they should be out there. That, that, that research has been done. And for whatever reason, it hasn't been published, but um, it, it, it should be out there and accessible to um, research consumers and to synthesizers uh, of the research base. Yeah, and I think a great illustration of this is this a tweet I plopped in here from Hillary Barth. It says, when you post an empirical report on a preprint journal with no intention to submit it to a journal for peer review, what's it called? Not really a preprint? Has the term been developed yet to signal that this paper is a terminal preprint? And I just really love this idea, sort of what Brian's talking about, which is, yeah, we all do studies that just fell to the back burner. Maybe it's no longer relevant. Maybe it's not <clears throat> you know, significant enough to get published. But if you make it into like this terminal preprint, right? You're never ever gonna submit it. At least it's sitting somewhere where someone can search for it and not do that idea, right? So they have, this is gonna help with meta-analyses, um, trying to figure out you know, who's run the studies, not only that have been published on the subject and found significant findings, but what about the people who didn't and including that in meta-analyses. Um, but yeah, just making sure that that work sees the light of day because we really don't wanna waste our participants' time or students' time, our own time. And so I think this is a, I really love the idea maybe there's like spring cleaning right for education researchers which is like get that file drawer out maybe submit one or two a year if you can and just make sure it sees the light of day yeah yeah, yeah we'll talk about i see the chat asking about preprint servers um we'll talk about that in a sec but yeah. i also wanted to, to mention really quickly um, some people fear the preprint ahead of publishing, but there's also these new models coming out. Um, like eLife just announced a preprint first publishing model. So you cannot publish in their journal until you've posted a preprint. And they did this because they surveyed their, um, their authors and like 80% of them or something like that uh, said that they were using preprints and they were like, this is cool. You're getting feedback from the field ahead of time. Like this makes sense for us. And so now some of these journals are starting to embrace these preprints so much that it becomes a part of their model. So I think this is maybe where things are gonna start turning. Um, so I feel very excited by this, but again, like we know not everyone is there, um, but yeah. That's really cool, Stacy. Yeah, I, it's interesting. I, yeah. I, I, I want to add that in last second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. um, very quickly, this is, it, it's a couple years old now, but these are um, average of one for citations, and they looked at these different models. Mm -hmm. So, closed model 0.9, um, the, the green model, which is primarily the preprints, is actually the highest. Um, uh, with uh, an average of 33% more citations than, than the average paper. And this, it, it may be due to, to some degree of, uh, from, it's preprinted, more people have access to it. My preprints, I am pretty consistently pleasantly surprised. Wow, I'm surprised that many people are downloading it. Um, there, is a, there is a market out there of people who can't access publications behind paywalls. And uh, I think uh, providing them access to uh, these through, uh, through preprints do, does a great uh, service. I do think some of this though is likely due to um, people are preprinting their papers that they're most excited about that may be more apt to get uh, citations anyway. And I think that's probably the same for the, the bronze um, the, the higher rate of, of, of the bronze um, public uh, the bronze OA model where some of that is what's well, getting more um, citations because it's it's more available to folks mm -hmm. but uh, some of that is they're probably the journals are, are choosing uh, and being selective over which papers that they choose to be bronze the gold being lower is is very interesting 
And in some ways you think, wow, so the gold open access journals aren't getting cited a lot. Um, I don't wanna publish my uh, paper in a gold access uh, journal. I, I think, and the authors hypothesize that this may be due to um, what I'd mentioned earlier, that a lot of uh, very small journals are kind of gold by default because they just have very low overhead. Um, they're a very small journal of a professional organization and they just aren't getting, uh, th those papers don't tend to get a lot of um, uh, citations just because they're, they're very specific to a small little field in, in, a, in a smaller journal. So that's probably what's behind the, the lower citation rate of, of gold journals. I, I don't wanna underemphasize as much as I'm a big fan and very excited about uh, preprints, probably the big limitation of, of preprints is that they're not peer reviewed. Um, I can post any crappy thing that I've ever thought on uh, as a, as a preprint. And on one hand, that's a limitation. And on another hand, it is kind of freeing in some way. There's not this veneer of, oh, it's been peer reviewed so we know it's true. I mean, it, you look at, at, at the growing retraction rate and the different uh, problems uh, with papers that have been published in peer reviewed journals. We know peer review is wonderful, um, but it, it, it is not a guarantee that every paper is perfectly valid that, that's been peer reviewed. And so preprints, it's, it's just a different world where this stuff hasn't been uh, peer reviewed very often. I, I do think it's it's important when being a consumer of preprints to to recognize that some of these really are preprints that that have haven't gone on to be peer reviewed and published, but many of the preprints that are available have been published, and uh, authors are are strongly encouraged to go back and update preprints with information and a corresponding DOI of a uh, digital object identifier if and when a preprint uh, gets probably uh, modified and, and changed a little bit through the peer review process, but uh, ultimately gets published. And so I haven't seen any liter. Now I, I have seen something and I'm gonna forget numbers off the top of my head. I think there is one study out on it, but there is a significant number of preprints actually correspond to um, work that is eventually uh, peer reviewed and published. So in some ways it's a misnomer to say that um, preprints aren't peer reviewed. Many of them end up getting peer reviewed, but there's no guarantee of that. And there is a caveat emptor uh, approach that one has to take with, with preprints and, and be a very critical uh, skeptical research consumer when you're looking at preprints because it, it, a lot of it uh, hasn't been peer reviewed. Can I add something to that, Brian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think another interesting argument here is that the biggest one is like preprints aren't peer reviewed, so like they're garbage or whatever, right? But we also have to remember like our conference presentations often aren't peer reviewed. Our posters aren't peer reviewed. TED Talks half the time are not peer reviewed. So, you know, this is not a problem that's unique to preprints. Yes, they carry this problem. And like Brian's talking about, a lot of them will become peer reviewed at some point. But I, I just want to remember that like, peer reviewed isn't like the, the standard every single thing of every single type of scientific dissemination. And so, yes, it has this problem, but also like this problem exists in other spaces. So it's not totally new. I'm gonna try to speed myself up a little bit here. So journal policies, be aware, um, a, a doctoral student uh, of mine and I just, uh, we have a paper in press looking at, uh, in, in our field of special education, journal policies regarding preprints. And there are, a, a, two or three of them that say that they won't accept a paper if it's been pre-printed. I, I think this is going, as, as preprints continue to grow in popularity, I think these, uh, the number of journals that have policies prohibiting the submission of preprints will decrease, but that's the journal's prerogative. I guess if, if they feel for whatever reason, and I guess it's just, they feel like that's gonna be competing with them for uh, citations and for a readership and why would someone pay to access the journal if, if it's available as, as a preprint. Uh, most journals, this hasn't 
been an issue, but was there a comment? Go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, right. So they want to make money is a lot of the argument. Is yeah. Like, yeah. I, you just made it available for free. And we would argue that, you know, scientific dissemination is more important than profits. Um, but yeah, I mean, so what you should do in that case, right, is look up Sherpa Romeo or shoot the, the editor an email saying, hey, if I preprint, is this going to be a problem? And they should be able to tell you, right? And, but, and yeah, it's it's a relatively small number of journals that have this policy, but know that some of that there are a few. Mm -hmm. You need to be careful. Yeah. Uh, and the policies aren't always clear so exactly. Uh, if, if, when in doubt, shoot the editor an email and say something that, that I've... Um, I thought about with the timing of my preprints is that especially when I write in within my little field of special education, writing an open act, writing a piece, especially in open science, I kind of haven't this, there's not a, there's not an infinite number of reviewers that it might go out to. It's, it's probably within this small group. If I, if I post a preprint and tweet it, I, I do worry that a lot of my potential pool of reviewers are now aware of the, the, that print and, and the blind review is compromised. And so sometimes when I write something that is a little in, in a niche where I'm worried about uh, it, a couple of times I pre-printed it and not tweeted it until later. And a couple of times I've just not pre-printed it until a little later. Um, I personally, I don't know, I, I, I think, I think that's smart. Yeah, if you're in that niche area and you're not sure if there's going to be any reviewers who won't be able to figure out who you are, or they find the preprint or whatever, just save that preprint and then mm -hmm. until after if you can post it, then just post it to make it more open access. Didn't really act as a preprint in the beginning, but you're still helping to make your work more accessible. Right. And the blind, it, I do think if someone really wants to find out who, there is an argument where well, we shouldn't preprint because then people, are, when they read something, they can search the internet and find the preprint and find out who you are. They can probably do that for most work that's out there already. Um, the, I, I don't think preprints. Uh, they, I think there there is that issue, but but it's not a, a, an issue unique to preprints at, at all. Um, this is just something real quick on the growth of preprints. It's in a different field. Um, um, I think it's the uh, biomedical preprints, but you can just see in the last few years, this is really taking off. Education is probably a little late to the game, um, but it is, it, it is uh, starting. And so a lot of the rest of this, I'll, I'll talk just uh, briefly here and we'll finish up on uh, Ed Archive, which is a, a relatively new uh, preprint archive or um, repository developed that's specific to the edu for education research. So there are multidisciplinary uh, preprints, sometimes they're called preprint servers, preprint archives, preprint re or print repositories. I'll call them print repositories here. There are some general ones. Uh, there are some domain specific ones. Uh, Sci archive, uh, one in psychology, bio archive in biology. Open science framework hosts 20 some uh, different domain specific repositories. Uh, open Science Framework is um, the, the, the web arm of uh, Center for Open Science. So here are, and some of them got some have some cool names and uh, logos. And so there was a group of us a couple of years ago and said, we should have one of these in education. And so we've uh, started Ed Archive. Don't know if I love our, our logo, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a start. It reminds me of like Ravenclaw, like from Harry Potter. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how we came upon that actually, but um, I, I think there's some benefits and largely to, to raise awareness and, and submission and use of preprints. We thought having something specific to education would be uh, helpful rather than kind of the education work getting lost uh, in these other fields or these uh, general uh, archives. And so uh, we launched it uh, late 2019. We have 661 preprints posted as of a, a few days ago, if I read my numbers correctly. Um, we, uh, it, it follows the same structure as all of the uh, print repositories. Uh, under OSF, there's uh, just eight different uh, steps that it's, I can do it and I'm not good at this stuff. And, 
So if I can do it, you can do it. Um, you have to create a, an account on OSF uh, first, uh, you submit a preprint, um, you upload the, the file, uh, author assertions, you, you indicate whether uh, pub, uh, data is publicly available, whether there's a pre-registration. I think you can link to those if, if it is. Um, you choose a license, which we can talk a little bit about more about that, but there's uh, different licenses. Um, they recommend the CCBY attribution, which means anyone can reuse your work as long as they attribute it. Uh, it's assigned uh, a DOI. Um, and, oh, and it, it's asked, is there a, a DOI associated with a publication? And then the DOI has actually become linked. And so citations for the preprint actually get credited uh, or associated with citations to the article. You put in yeah. keywords and abstract, put a discipline label, authors, and, and a conflict of interest statement. I think so. Uh, one question in chat among some other interesting conversation is like talking about the licenses. And that's definitely where I get stuck. I'm like, I don't know anything about licenses. Like, what the heck am I supposed to do? At least I know on OSF, they've tried to make um, it very easy to look at the different licenses. So I know at least when you pre register, it says like, what type of license do you want? And there's like a little icon that you can click and it opens up into this big broad thing talking about what these licenses mean, which are the most common, what you get for what. Um, so you can definitely check out those resources um but yeah overall like licenses like i don't know brian if you're an expert i'm definitely not but usually i just look at the guidance that's provided on the website and just go for like the creative common ones usually yeah i i know the creative common ones pretty well and they're um i think there's six different options and, and the the two most popular doesn't mean that they're right uh or the right ones but the two most popular are the ccby which means Basically, um, anybody can do whatever they want with it, as long as they attribute uh, the, the original source, right? They say where they got it from. Uh, CCBYNC is a derivation of that where anyone can use it as long as it's used non-commercially is the NC. Uh, and so um, I actually, I, 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 I think I've done either CCBY or CCBYNC, not for any particular reason, it's just kind of, <laughs> what mood I'm in <laughs> and, yeah. and some for some things I don't want someone else to make money off this and so right, you do right. the CCBY and C um, and that means anyone can use it as long as they attribute it uh, outside of for commercial it has to be a non-commercial venture great so we got some good links in the chat thank you everyone for plopping in creative commons license uh, more information about that but we also have a question which is um, just to hear about our opinion about how institutions of higher ed view preprints, um, especially for early career researchers who are seeking to attain academic positions. Um, while you think about that, Brian, I can just come in real quick. So I graduated at the beginning of quarantine with my PhD and I just uh, started my assistant professorship now. So it's been like really weird, very fast. But what I ended up doing before I went on the job market is I took all of the work that was sort of sitting around waiting to be peer reviewed and I made them into preprints and I put them on my website. That way, at least when people were searching for me um, and they wanted to see what I had published, my work was being, they could read about it, right? So it wasn't an official preprint just because I wasn't too sure about it back then and my life is chaos, um, but I definitely was able to put it on my website. Um, and I used something called Pretty Preprints, which is by Brenton Wernick. Uh, you can literally Google Pretty Preprints. It'll show up on the OSF page where you can format them. Uh, yeah, we have a slide at the very end um where here they are so you can format them to look official i've even fooled myself into thinking my preprint was my actual published pdf uh, but it makes it look a little bit official you can put it on your website just to show that you're you're sort of have momentum even if things have been held up in the publishing um but an interesting question along that is like yeah how do higher institutions view preprints i think we're still trying to figure it out but brian maybe you have some ideas i think they're still trying to figure it out um the, this isn't really on the radar for like um, tenure and promotion committees very, very much. They just don't know what to, to make of it. And I'm not sure they should because it, it is something that anybody can post almost anything a, as a preprint. So I'm, uh, it, it, it's, I think it's, it looks good. I think there is a greater awareness of the benefits of doing this. Um, 
I don't think it's going to take the place uh, anytime soon and, and maybe shouldn't of a peer reviewed article. What it does do is uh, like, like Stacy was saying, uh, if you're going out in the job market um, and rather than just having your CV where you have six things um, you submitted, or uh, maybe that's a little ambitious, but you've got a few things listed as submitted or under review. Um, well, what's that mean exactly? Here you have a, a preprint where you can put a link in and people can go actually read the document. Yeah, especially and, and, if it's your newest work, right? And you're phasing out old stuff or something like that. And you want them to have a well-represented view of sort of what you're doing now. Because it could take years to publish something, right? I, I personally struggle with, um, I don't want to look like I'm padding my CV. And so yeah. I don't list uh, preprints on really? my CV. But I feel like in a way I should but I, I, I don't have good answers to that. And I think it's something that is kind of evolving how we, how we deal with that in terms yeah, of- Yeah, it's the question of like, if it's submitted, should I put it on my CV, right? Like there's some question yeah. about that. And I think the preprint's in the same sort of boat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, that's not a terribly satisfying answer, but um, <laughs> I, I, I don't think, it, well, I only have two publications, but I've got 20 preprints. I don't think that's going to get you tenure. Um, but I, I, I think there is some level of growing recognition, at least in some places that, well, that's, that's wonderful that you're making your work uh, available, uh, freely, openly accessible to uh, a variety of stakeholders. And that's how I would kind of frame it. Not that I'm trying to do this instead of uh, having a, a body of peer reviewed research uh, and scholarship, but instead adding to it by making it more generally accessible by preprinting it. Uh, and so this is the Ed Archive, and if you just click, a, I'm, I'm gonna go through this uh, briefly, but you need to open an account here at the sign up button. You do a submit a, a preprint here to submit. This is just a screenshot of the, the end of the process where you, um, uh, for this one, I said I didn't have a conflict of interest and there's a, an option to include supplemental materials. And then at the end, you just click submit preprint. And it, it is a fairly straightforward process. Um, for consuming preprints, uh, you can uh, search, you can put in your own search terms. They have subject terms you can search by. Um, they, at our, uh, any, any of the, uh, most of the, the larger uh, print repositories, uh, assigned DOIs. So they're all searchable and they'll come up in, in Google Scholar. Uh, you can also read and comment on manuscripts using they have a, a new tool on the OSF uh, body of, of re print repositories, Hypothesis. And so you can actually uh, make little notes as you go. And the idea is eventually that even though it's not peer reviewed uh, to be posted, that, that, that we would, Ideally, we develop uh, a community that, that comments on each other's works and that will help uh, serve as, as kind of a form of peer review. And you can always download manuscripts. Um, I'm not going to go over this because we're running out of time, but uh, I just did a, a search. Uh, one of my, a, a doctoral student of mine, these are the different, uh, some of the uh, subject terms that you can browse by. Um, and so the I was looking for my doc student posted as, as a preprint uh, this uh, flow chart about how to post a preprint. This little eye thing here is how I could comment on it using hypothesis. I'm a good advisor, so I gave a, a plot it to it, uh, endorsing this work. I should have put in a new screenshot. This is a month old now. I'm sure it has many more downloads now, but it, uh, it displays an abstract, the DOI, the license, so he chose the CCBY, so you can use this and profit off it if you'd like. Uh, uh, disciplinary uh, uh, term there, tags that, that he entered, and then uh, citations, uh, APA citations. Interestingly, uh, one thing to point out here is this is version two, so there was something on it. 
uh, maybe I told him, oh, this is misspelled, or I don't know, I forget what happened, but he, you can post different versions of it. And so this will tell you it was originally submitted on April 30th, but then it was updated on May 7th with this second version. And so it displays the most recent version, but if you want to go back, you can download, you can look at and download previous versions as well. And I just put a link if you want to download this. It actually is, a, I think, a nice flowchart. So there's just a link to the flowchart. And I'm not going to go over it now. We don't have the time. Uh, and so this is what we talked about. Um, questions, discussion, thanks very much. Some references. Um, I hyperlinked the stuff in my slides. And we wanted to just make sure we mentioned uh, pretty preprints, which we already have. Um, this, the how much the, the pandemic has uh, put the preprints on, on the map in, in many ways. And then some horror stories. I had this in case anyone was like, but what about the horror stories? Yeah, sometimes people put things on their journal's website that's like totally cool if you use preprints and then people actually preprint and then they apply or they submit and then like, editors are like, oh my God, why did you do that? And then people freak out. So we're still in that transition phase, right? We're trying to figure out like how to incorporate this into our practice. I think the kinks are still being worked out. Um, don't let this deter you. I think most people tend to have a pretty good experience, although I do want you to be aware that there are some horror stories out there, but they exist. Um, hopefully you can just reach out to the editor ahead of time, just make sure it's kosher before you go forward um, and then preprint your work. And then again, um, I normally how I use preprints is I just do it after the things published that way people can find it easier. Um, it helps open access. Um, my goal moving forward is to try and preprint using the ed archive more, um, but definitely like if you're just getting started and you're not comfortable yet use those things as the last step of your publishing to make it more open access. Um, does anyone have any questions. Thank you, Brian, for controlling the PowerPoint. You're welcome. Thank you for presenting that, that that was fun yeah. and yeah so we have just a few minutes now of just discussion questions i i have a question you you kind of mentioned something about the tenure process uh, or the processes that are uh you know kind of being run under the tradi most traditional criteria to evaluate researchers do you think that uh, there's room for these open science practices, at least here in the U.S. Do you, I, I, you can go first. <laughs> um, yes, I think there's room for them, potentially. I, I, I love the idea. Um, I, I think there are there is some anecdotal evidence uh, where I, I think, unfortunately, it is more about, oh, well, someone who's, <laughs> who's a dean or a provost or chair of the tenure and promotion committee uh, really appreciates this. I think there are uh, perhaps some institutions that are more broadly receptive or, or interested in it, but generally, I, I think it's, it's not uh, well established. Um, I, I mentioned before that I don't put prints or preprints on my CV. Um, I don't. I don't think I've put pre-registrations on, and I should. I think pre-registrations are um, something that should count for for something. Um, yeah, I I think we've just become so grants, publications, and. Um, it, it, it's part of the problem when it's just counting up the grants and looking at the journal impact factor, but that's the established system. And I think it's gonna take some time to get away from that. I don't think preprints are probably the, um, are, are, are going to be what, what carries the, the day in terms of tenure decisions ever. But I think some of these other, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's good to have and, and can look positive. It, I, I don't think it, it can hurt but I think things like um, pre-registration and data sets and material, uh, shared materials that, that can accrue citations too and really show an impact 
really could and should count uh, in, in, in the tenure and promotion and hiring considerations. Um, I, I think there's limited evidence that, that they do right now, but I think that's kind of part of, uh, would be w within the, the universe of, of this conference is to try to, to think about how to change that. Yeah, and I would even add that I think just looking at the signs, a lot of how we're thinking about publishing, I think is going to change um, with the addition of preprints, with ongoing battles with large publishers like Elsevier, um, you know, the UC system, Hungary, Germany, Nor uh, Norway, pulling their licenses, their subscriptions from these giants because they're for profit. I think there's a lot of change that's going to happen. And there's even some talk of trying to get people to form coalitions to peer review pre, uh, preprints so to give them that stamp of approval so that they'll count as high as a, you know, a peer review journal article, but not have to pay for it. So I think right now, um, everything Brian says is true. Like people aren't really sure what to make of them. It's not gonna get you tenure. It's not gonna look as good as a peer reviewed article. But I do think that in the coming years, like we're probably gonna see some shifting of what this means, how they're treated and how we use them, not only to disseminate our work, but how they help us with our scientific prestige or or how we sort of value them in our in our science and so i'm really interested in the future i'm hoping education researchers will begin to use these to more broadly disseminate their work and hopefully there's added value to that in our own careers because i mean the goal of science is to do science and to disseminate it and so um, i think preprints can really help us overcome a lot of the weird cultural things that we've developed as a science which is like paying for articles and the taxpayer pays for them and all these other sorts of things. So it's a really good question. Um, but I'm hopeful that in the future will be more open access and more value um, dedicated to people who use open science practices. Yeah, as, as Stacy alluded to, and I, uh, we're out of time, um, but I, for those of you with an interest in kind of more radical uh, change, there are some really interesting models uh, that are alternatives to the traditional publishing model that, that would rely on things like, like prints as the main basis for just knowledge dissemination. And perhaps journals play a role, but it's much more uh, a secondary uh, kind of way to um, uh, amplify uh, certain selected uh, products, but but that the the core of knowledge dissemination would be this much more open model of let's get everything out there. Thanks, everybody. I don't want to make. Uh, um, oh well, we're just making you late for lunch, huh? Well, I don't want to make you late for lunch, but I feel even worse if we made you uh, late for for presentations. But uh, thanks so much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And, uh... Thanks, both of you. Thank you.